Matthew chapter 7, a message entitled uh, Judging Others, as we continue uh, with the Sermon on the Mount and our verse-by-verse study in, uh, in Matthew. And as you turn there, we'll, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump in here. Father, we just want to come before you again as we study your word, and, and um, as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, it's... Uh, Boy, it's so, so practical and so where we live, uh, the issues that are covered. Last time, the issue of materialism. This time, the, uh, the idea of having discernment, how to, ha- how to have discernment, but how to not cross a line and, uh, and judge others and, and uh, in effect, them becoming hypocrites ourselves. So we pray that um, you would um, uh, just help through your spirit, bring clarity to, to our thinking in regards to this very important issue. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Pastor Kevin has a good friend that uh, lives in uh, Singapore. He lived here in the islands for a few years, and um, they got to know each other, and we've, we've met on a few occasions. He was, he was visiting one time uh, back in the islands and, and um, came down to the office, and we went and had lunch together, and he was telling us about uh, how in that last year, since he had seen us previously, a very well-known televangelist from the United States had come to Singapore. A couple of things that were interesting about it. One is that they didn't really know anything about him. Um, you know, if I mentioned his name, you'd have some preconceived ideas of, of what his ministry is like and so forth, but they have none. They just knew that he was kind of famous. He was on television a lot, uh, had a lot of notoriety, had written several books, and he was coming to Singapore, and it was widely publicized. And, um, I mean, uh, a lot of money spent on, on, uh, on that aspect of it. And so it was kind of a stadium event, first night, pretty well packed out and uh, people not really knowing what to expect but you know there's a certain amount of hype that goes into some of these things and uh, as the evening went on he finally came up to kind of share or address the crowd or whatever because I'm not really sure I should I'm not sure if I can call it preaching or teaching because I'm just saying he's addressing the crowd Uh, and as he did then after you know 10 15 20 minutes that people are all listening and then they begin to uh, stand up and leave uh, I think it was like half or two thirds actually got up and walked out on this very well known televangelist. And we, you know, Kevin and I were like, wow, you know, we know who, you know, uh, a bit about this guy's minister, and we thought that was probably a good thing. And uh, we thought, well, right on, that's, that's discernment. He says, yeah, but the other third didn't leave. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, well, and that was his point. I mean, it was so clear cut to them that what he was saying did not gr- agree with the Bible, that the appropriate thing to do would be to reject that teaching and, and, and leave, which, which they did. I don't know what the, I think the percentage here in the United States would be far less than that. Of course, a lot of people that would walk out wouldn't go to start with, so it's a little, it's hard to compare or anything. The point is they exercised some discernment They judged what they were hearing compared to biblical truth. Jesus starts out in verse 1 saying, do not judge. Were they wrong in doing that? Were they right in doing that? I want to say that they were right, and as we get into that, we'll look at a couple of Greek words that's very important to distinguish between these two ideas of having discernment and distinguishing things one from another versus uh, judging. Again, a key verse in the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5.20. There Jesus says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom uh, of heaven. And uh, again, very shocking statement to Peter and the boys that are listening. And uh, as uh, we know from uh, Luke's gospel, this was a a message Jesus gave several times. And in Luke's gospel, he's giving it before the Pharisees. 
Uh, but at this point in time, they would be very shocked because they believe that if only two people made it to heaven, it would be a Pharisee and it would be a scribe. And Jesus is saying, unless your righteousness surpasses them, you're not going to make it. So this is a very shocking statement. And then he uh, ushers in to the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, we have mentioned several times that uh, the people that say they like the Sermon on the Mount, I'm convinced they've never really read it all the way through. Because I just have to tell you, I don't like it. It bothers me every week when I have to study this and then teach it to you guys. You think you're having a tough time with some of these issues like materialism and now judging others? I have to study it all week long. I'm getting way more beat up than you guys are over all of this. Jesus knows how to push the buttons and say, you really think you're righteous? And of course, we could say, well, he's talking to the Pharisees and we're not like the Pharisees. No, it's, it's much broader than that. He's now just on the top of this mountain talking to uh, his personal disciples of which we would say uh, we are the same. The first point here in verses 1 to 5 is that we're not to judge the motives of others. And I've kind of framed it that way and we'll try to explain as we go on. Verse 1 says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So first and very clearly, we're not to judge others. Two main words in the Greek uh, that he uses here, this one is krino or krino. K-R-I-N-O in transliteration, it means to render a verdict or a final conclusion. Uh, and the bottom line is only God can do this. Only God could look at a person's heart. All we can do is look at the external circumstances of that person and that person's life or that spiritual condition. And even then, we don't have all the details. We don't have all the facts. Uh, we can't know their hearts. We can't even know our own hearts. Jeremiah says our own hearts are desperately wicked. Who can know it? I can't even know my own or my own motives. How can I possibly know somebody else's motives? So the point is only God can judge this way. Now when Jesus says do not judge, uh, literally in the Greek it means stop doing this. Uh, the, uh, again, the point is Jesus is saying you do this, and it's a regular thing. You have a tendency to do it, so stop it. And we've, we've seen him use that kind of phrase several times so far in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, John 5.22 says, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Only Jesus is going to make the final judgment about somebody's spiritual condition. Oh, I heard that brother so-and-so repented. That's great, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Are you kidding me? That guy has said that like 15 times. If I had a nickel for every time that guy repented, I'd be a rich man today. I don't believe it. Jesus says, don't do that. There's no way that you can look into that person's heart and know whether they've really repented or not, to know that they've really changed or not. We'll just have to wait and see. Only God could know those kinds of things. So Jesus says, do not judge in that sense. There's another word that's used in the New Testament, diacrino, which means uh, to have discernment, to distinguish between things. And we're actually told to do that several times, and we'll look at some of the instances in a, uh, in a moment. But it's again important to see that in the area of when it comes to the motives of the heart, the spiritual condition of somebody's life and so forth, uh, we need to be careful that we don't pronounce some kind of final judgment over them because we can't look into their hearts and minds. We can't know the motives of, of the heart. And uh, it's important to understand that as well as what I, else I'm about ready to say because you've probably heard the line, you're concerned about somebody's spiritual condition. Uh, you go to them, you try to share with them. Hey, don't judge me, man. That's what the Bible says. Don't judge me, man. So it's funny. There, there's a lot of non-Christians that, that they only know one verse in the Bible, and it's Matthew 7 and 1. They don't know exactly where it is, but they know, they know those words. Jesus said, don't judge me. And that's true. He said, don't judge you. Uh, and there's an element where we're not to, we're to stop to, because it's our tendency. But yet there's another area where we'll need to. Secondly, when we judge the motives of others, 
our own motives will be judged to the same degree. And, and he makes it that very clear here. We need to be careful because uh, as we, and, and this was true of the Pharisees, as they looked down and critically judged others, uh, in the end, they would be judged and held to the same degree and same account uh, as well. And third, we can judge others without judging their motives uh, and uh, Jesus is not saying that we should have no discernment. I want to take you through a, a couple of uh, passages from, uh, from 1 Corinthians as well as Hebrews, but even in our passage here, as you get down to chapter 7, verse 15, it's watch out for false prophets. They will come to you in sheep's clothing, but in, inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you'll recognize them. So in a passage that he's saying, don't judge, he's saying, but you need to judge. You're going to have to be able to tell false prophets. You're going to have to exercise some kind of discernment. So it's important to understand the use of the, of the two words and, uh, and how it's applied to the body today. Let's go through a few of them. Paul instructs in 1 Corinthians 6, 2 about the fact that we'll judge in the future. He says, uh, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you were to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we'll judge angels? How much more the things of this life? In the future, you and I as as uh, God's children, as his saints of the body of Christ, will we'll judge the world with him uh, at a point in time. He says, now, being that the case, aren't you capable of, of judging trivial things now? now? Obviously, it's a rhetorical question, uh, and it's yes. Someday we will, with Christ, be judging angels. Uh, and uh, presumably, obviously, the fallen angels, how much more the things of this life. So there's, there's an element where we're not to judge but according to the Paul, there's also times when we should be able to make judge, judgments or distinguish things. Another reference, 1 Corinthians 12, 10, to another, these are talking about spiritual gifts, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing, uh, and that's our same Greek word, between spirits. So spiritual discernment can be a, a spiritual gift. Some people are very gifted in the area of encouragement, uh, in mercy and so forth. They're just over the top. I mean, you might be kind, but that person is like, you can't get over how kind they are. It's like ridiculous. They're gifted in that area. And in the, in the same way, uh, there are those that are gifted in this area of distinguishing things. Uh, diacrino, again, uh, distinguishing of spirits, of discernment. Uh, they're not the only ones, though. It's for everybody. Hebrews 5.12. In fact, though, by this time, you ought to be teachers, the writer there says. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to, and that's our word again, distinguish good from evil. Again, writer of Hebrews says that as if you're growing and maturing in Christ, you should be growing in your ability to distinguish good from evil, truth from error. Uh, again, things that are relative to uh, activities and doctrine in the body of Christ. You should be able to look at, hear someone teach doctrine and look at the Bible and tell whether it's truth or error. You should be able to look at someone's lifestyle and what the Bible says a Christian should look like and be able to tell whether it matches up or not. Uh, again, it's not something that you get chronologically by growing older in the Lord. It's those that have trained themselves uh, in the word of God. I know people that have been walking with the Lord for 20 years, they don't have a bit of discernment at all. I mean, the, the issues they struggle with and whether this is really right or not or really right for their kids or not, it's like, no, that's not really an issue. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, Bible's pretty clear on that one. And uh, uh, it's interesting. I, I just got a call about a, a week ago. Somebody, somebody called, you know, people call in with questions and so forth. And I talked to them. And, and this person obviously had a couple of roommates that were t total new agers. And she was naming the books that they were giving her to read and different things. And they were, uh, they were pretty radical. And, and uh, I said, no, those those, those books wouldn't be really good for you to read. They're, they're not really biblical. They don't really line up with scripture. In fact, that person that they're talking about there actually claims to be the, a God man and so forth. So yeah, that's, those aren't healthy things for you to be. I mean, it was pretty obvious, right? 
And uh, I think probably half the kids in our Sunday school could have probably figured this out, you know, pretty quickly. That's not in the Bible. Jesus wouldn't like that, you know. But yet, here was a, a, an adult claiming to be a Christian struggling because they had never trained themselves to distinguish good and evil by constant use of, of the scripture. So it's a spiritual gift, uh, but even beyond that, it's something that everybody could have, should have, uh, by training themselves in the word of God. Now, early in the letter, Paul gives instructions about uh, judging and who should be judged in 1 Corinthians, again, 5, 9, uh, verse 9 to 13. He says, I've written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. But now I am writing that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat. What business uh, is it of uh, mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside you, though, expel the, the wicked man from among you. Uh, guess what? Sinners sin. I mean, that's, that's not really a big issue. Yeah, we're, we're never told to, to, uh, to judge what people are doing that don't know Christ. I and mean, they're just doing what they do, and that's what they do, and we just need to pray for them to get saved. You know, it's not going to help anybody to, you know, point out all their faults to them and, uh, and so forth. And unless they're, they, they don't really get the concept of, of sin and being separated from God and, and, and so forth. So, uh, but generally that's, that's not what we're uh, to be all about. This idea of exercising discernment, distinguishing good from evil, judging should be only for other believers in the body of Christ. It comes from being trained in the word of God, although it could be a, a spiritual gift as well. How are we, are we to judge? Well, again, 1 Corinthians 2, a little earlier in the book, verse 13. Hang in here with me. This is my last cross-reference. This is what we speak. Very important, verse 13. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths and spiritual words. What are the spiritual truths and spiritual words that Paul is expressing? It's the Bible. Verse 14, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Uh, again, uh, what are the words taught by the Spirit? It's, it's the Scriptures. It's the Bible. What are we to use to judge someone else? It's the Bible. I, I got a call from uh, Pastor Bill maybe a year or so ago, and he asked me uh, if I would take the time to listen to uh, a program on, uh, on the radio and, and then uh, maybe for a couple weeks or so, and, uh, and then kind of get back to him and, and tell him if I thought what was being taught was was uh, scriptural or not, whether it was biblical or, or not, which I, I, I did. And I don't have a, a lot of time to just kind of sit and listen to the radio unless I'm driving somewhere normally. But I took the time on a, a couple of occasions over a couple of weeks to hear some of these messages. And, and as I did, then knowing what Bill had asked me to do, and I would listen along. And then anytime I, I heard something that I thought was not biblical, I would write it down. And then I would later look up the reference to what it really said and write that out. And I just kind of made, made a list over a couple of weeks of at least eight or nine or ten things that were said that were not, not biblical. Um, and so then I, I called him back and I kind of went through this, uh, this list with him. Uh, what I was doing was what Paul was saying to do here. Now, I wasn't judging the person. As far as I know, he's the greatest guy in the world. He could be a wonderful husband and father, a very loving, kind, gracious uh, individual. I don't even know the guy. Uh, all I was doing, which was biblical, what Paul is talking about here, I was just listening to what he said and see if it lined up with Scripture or not. And on many occasions, uh, it didn't. And I uh, went ahead and Bill and I, Kind of had a little conversation about that together. We're not to judge condemningly, critically of somebody else. Uh, and uh, because only God can know the motive of the heart. Uh, only God can, can know exactly what's going on in, in that person's life. 
we cannot render a final verdict over some, somebody else. Well, that guy's not saved. There's no way that guy's saved. We, 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 you know, we're, we're just not in no position to make those kind of statements. Uh, and and there's, there's temptations, maybe out of anger or hurt or whatever, to make statements like that. And, that's, uh, and Jesus says, stop doing that. At, at the same time, I, I can look at a person's lifestyle that is external. I can't see inside them, but externally I can see uh, that they are living sex, a sexually immoral life, for example. And I can look at scripture and, and list several that says, don't do that. If you're a Christian, don't do that. You should stop doing that. I can make that discernment. I can look at an external lifestyle, compare it to scripture. I can look at doctrine and compare it to scripture. And by the way, you're supposed to be doing this too. I'm saying I'm doing this, but we're, this is what we're all supposed to be doing here. We'd have a lot less trouble in the body of Christ if, if everybody did this, right? Uh, there would be a lot more people walking out of stadium events and, uh, and turning off uh, television programs and, and so forth. A lot less people would be being ripped off financially and, and spiritually if we exercised diacrino, the kind of discernment uh, that Jesus is, is talking about here. A couple of things on both sides of the coin here negatively. Uh, one is that uh, we need to be careful and not become making those final, judgmental, critical kind of statements because when we do, very often we're demonstrating what's in our own hearts. And uh, that's what the Pharisees did over and over again. We need to be very, very careful. Classic uh, illustration, David. David commits Bash, uh, adultery with Bathsheba, has Uriah killed, and you know for a period of time just kind of thought he'd glossed over the whole thing and lived in a state of, of denial, although in retrospect he said he was being eaten up on the inside because of the sin. His good friend, the prophet of the whole nation, Nathan, comes to him and, uh, and confronts him, putting his own life on the line, and says, David, let me tell you a story. Uh, there was a a man, uh, and uh, he was a very wealthy man, and he was having dinner guests. Now, even though he had many flocks of sheep, he went to his poor neighbor and took his little lamb that they cared for in the home like a pet, and he pulled it out of the guy's house, and then he, he uh, 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 killed it and butchered it, and, and they had it for, for dinner and so forth. It was uh, a terrible thing. What, what do you think should be done to this man? Oh, David was enraged. He says, kill him. You know, that's a horrible thing to do. And then Nathan says, you're the man, David. It's very easy to be very critical and judgmental sometimes of the conditions of our own heart. If we find ourselves in this condition, we need to realize we may be demonstrating something that actually uh, we're living out ourselves to a greater or a lesser degree or slightly different circumstances. Secondly, it demonstrates a lack of mercy in our own hearts. Now, when Jesus teaches the same thing in Luke's, Luke's gospel, he concludes by saying in Luke 6, 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. When we are very critical and judgmental, condemning a final decision about somebody, judging their motives and so forth, uh, we're not showing any kind of mercy. And Jesus says we should be showing mercy because we've been shown a lot of mercy uh, ourselves. Only God can judge righteously because only he can see a, a person's heart. Uh, the other thing, when I judge, I better have a clear chapter and verse for my judgment. Like uh, in my illustration of this conversation with Pastor Bill, I gave him a scripture and a verse for everything that I said. If we're going to you know, exercise this kind of discernment and so forth. It's not my opinion. It's not what I feel. It's not what I think. It's not based on the experience. Well, one time this happened to me and I think he's doing the same thing. No, it's, it's, it, none of that matters. It's just whether it agrees with the Bible or, or it doesn't. And it can't be your own personal interpretation of what the Bible says. It's just what the Bible says. Uh, for I should have, uh, not have a judgmental attitude uh, again, that is quick to condemn because there's just times uh, I, I don't have all the facts. Uh, and we need to be very, uh, very careful in, in uh, hearing something from somebody uh, about someone and being very quick to condemn without really knowing the situation. Five, if I'm judgmental and condemning of others, Jesus says, you'll find yourself being condemned and judged uh, as well. So 
We're not to judge the motives of others. Also in the first five verses then, we're to judge ourselves first. And we see that in this illustration. We're to judge ourselves before we try and help someone else. The illustration is a a kind of a comical one if you've ever seen it illustrated. The person with the plank coming out of his eye trying to remove the speck of sawdust coming out of uh, somebody else's eye. The illustration deals with vision. Uh, We really can't help someone else. We can't see to help someone else. The issue is not that someone else doesn't have an issue or sin or something on in their lives. They do, apparently, but we're in no position to help them. Now, this was the Pharisees, certainly. Very judgmental, very critical of others, and, and often quite willing to do that to put them down to elevate themselves. Uh, in Luke 16, verse 14 Uh, There's a little conversation with Jesus with the Pharisees. Luke makes this comment. He says, the Pharisees who love money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. Again, this idea of the Sermon on the Mount. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men. But God knows your heart. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. What's detestable in God's sight? Religiosity. People who are pretending to be righteous uh, when they're not, pretending to represent God when they don't, uh, and so forth. And the, the Pharisees were like that. They loved money, and so they would use what they loved and the sin of others to try to justify themselves. And, and, uh, and Jesus says, uh, you can't do that. You can't put other people down in order to elevate yourself. Uh, you need to examine yourself first. And you can imagine, I, um, again, I, uh, uh, you know, remember playing golf with a, a guy that I really respected, uh, you know, in, in Calvary Hill a little when we were first there and stuff, and he was kind of one of the leaders in the church, and they're, oh, this is a, we're going to go play with these guys, all oh, this will be fun and everything, and I'll play a lot, but this will be great fellowship, and, and I was kind of shocked because the one guy just had a, it's like, when I'm on the golf course, it's like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. I mean, he was so serious, you know, about everything. And it's like, I didn't really play that. It was more for a good time, you know. And I don't pay a lot of money to have a bad time. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, if you hit a bad one, you just find another ball and hit another one. Right, Micah? That's what we do. We're out there for a good time. And, uh, but, he, you know, it's like, it's nothing, you know, so I was kind of like, uh, you know. Anyways, we went on. He wasn't playing that well. And, man, and then he's like slamming his clubs down. And then one time he threw his club. I used to have an uncle that was like, that was kind of comical to play with. But, but I was kind of shocked because this is guy, kind of one of the leaders in the church and stuff, just radical temper. Now, you can imagine if later I was struggling with an issue of anger and this brother came to, you know, minister to me. It's not going to fly, is it? And it wouldn't be that I didn't have an issue. It's just that I don't want to hear it because <laughs> you're like way worse than I am. So even what you're saying is true. I still don't want to hear it. This is what Jesus is saying. Now, our problem is we don't even know. We've never even taken the time to judge ourselves, to distinguish first, so that we can actually help or minister to someone else. So it's very important. Warren Wordsby um, says this, and I, I think it's interesting. He says, two extremes must be avoided in this matter of spiritual self-examination. The first is the deception of shallow examination. We can be deceived and just think that, well, you have kind of, yeah, Lord, examine my heart. And yeah, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm not real good in that area. Help me, Lord. You know, we can be so shallow. We just kind of gloss over the, uh, the whole thing. Uh, the second extreme is, he says, what I call a perpetual autopsy. We get so wrapped up in self-examination, we become unbalanced. Where it's like, it's all about me, Jesus. You know, and, uh, you know, and then we get so condemning. Uh, of ourselves and, and, uh, and really miss the grace of God and so forth. Uh, don't go to an extreme either way, but um, we need to judge ourselves. The second aspect of this, if we judge ourselves first, if we don't, uh, then we're going to become hypocrites. And uh, I don't think there's anybody who wants to sign up on that list. Would you like to sign up and be a hypocrite? Just sign up right over there. I think that's what we're all trying to uh, avoid. And I know for myself, uh, that, that is a frightful thing because uh, uh, growing up in kind of an organized church, going to a Christian college and so forth, I, I saw more than my fair share, uh, way more than my fair share. 
uh, of people in very important positions that were various. What I could see as a young guy growing up and as a young guy in college, pretty, pretty hypocritical, and it was pretty obvious. And, um, and probably, uh, uh, though it was my own sin and my own blindness, probably uh, the, the Satan used it to really keep me away from the Lord for a number of, a number of years. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that is the last thing I want to ever become. You know, if you've, if you've been on the other end of that, it's like you, you don't want to become the thing you despise. Uh, and, and according to Jesus, we will if we don't really judge ourselves uh, and examine ourselves. And again, the examination is not your comparison to someone else. Because there's someone always worse, Right. And I think that uh, because we're talking about this Wednesday night, because of the fact that it seems like there's a lot more evil in the world, or we're just a lot more aware of it because of the information age that we live in. It's one of the two. But there's just like horrific things going on all the time with, uh, with people. I mean, just a couple of the news stories locally here in the last couple of months in terms of abuse to kids, it's just like, let's just kill the guy. You know, I mean, it's just like, make sure you got the right guy and then let's just public execution. You know, we don't want this happening. You know, you know it just, it dri- you know, drives you crazy. Uh, but, you know, we need to be uh, very, very careful. We can become uh, uh, so hypocritical and not judging our, uh, ourselves. We need to judge ourselves first. We're not to judge the motives of others. We are to judge ourselves. Uh, three, we're to carefully judge others when sharing sacred things. Interesting verse, verse six. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to the pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. This is kind of a a peculiar verse that probably stands out when lifted out of context. But again, in context, the subject of discernment and judging, uh, we need discernment. We need judgment in sharing What he says is sacred things. Now, certainly this could be the gospel, the truth of the gospel. Uh, It could be, uh, again, the the, the, the truth of God's word in terms of practical things about living and so forth. Uh, One pastor said, uh, we need to discern who is a sheep and distinguish them from who are the dogs and who are the hogs. (laughs) That was in the illustration, not just my words. But uh, it seems like very sharp kind of words from, uh, from Jesus the reason for judgment or discernment is that, again, we wouldn't condemn others so that we'd be able to minister to others. Well, how do we know who to minister to? Well, we need discernment, and that, that's going to lead into his next point. We need to ask, we need to seek, we need to knock, man. We need to be in prayer uh, over these, uh, these issues. Sometimes, um, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but not everybody's interested in hearing the gospel. You know, I've just... I've noticed that from time to time. In fact, some people just, you know, it kind of infuriates them. You know, it's, it's funny. There was a, uh, <coughs> Lane sent me a little email article in the advertiser uh, yesterday, the day before, about how um, all the churches, what we call church row coming into Kailua, all lined up there. Uh, that land was all given to them years ago, and they were able, that's why those churches are all, the, all there together. We used to see churches as being a really good thing in the community, did everything we could uh, zoning and property wise to make sure we had lots of them because we saw them as a good thing. So that's why they're all lined up there together. And uh, apparently a neighbor or somebody complained that uh, their signs that have been on their buildings for like 50 years were not in compliance with the current zoning laws. And so somebody went out uh, from the city and county and, and uh, wrote citations for uh, every one of them if the letters were too big or if they had more than one sign and so forth. Uh, I would say that person would probably be not the best candidate for sharing spiritual things with. You know, the person that made that, that is, you know, he's just against all, of, uh, all about it. But uh, sometimes it may be the way that we're sharing as well. There's a funny little story in a, uh, in a book called Seismic Shifts by Kevin Harney. And he talks about a lady named Margaret who had a little Yorkshire terrier. And someone had told her if you, uh, if you give him a little spoonful of castor oil every day, he'll be healthier and his coat will shine and all this kind of stuff. And I have no idea if that's true or not. But uh, she believed that it was. And so every day she would uh, go through this routine, going to the medicine cabinet, 
uh, getting the castor oil, then going to the kitchen and opening the drawer to get the spoon. Well, the dog, <laughs> it didn't take long. If you got animals, you know this. The, uh, by the time she, she, the drawer, the sound of the drawer began to open in combination with her coming from the bath, the dog was hitting the road, man. He had his hiding places right behind the toilet where it's hard to get him, under the bed, and she would uh, go through these annex every day chasing this little dog down and then corner him and grabbing him and then just, you know, the spoonful of oil uh, down the throat. The funny thing happened one day, she was uh, wrestling with him on the kitchen floor and his back foot kicked over the bottle of oil all over the kitchen floor. So she released the dog and she went to get towels to uh, start cleaning up uh, the, the oil. As she came back into the kitchen, here's the dog over there lapping it up <laughs> to her uh, chagrin. Uh, he says in writing his article, in one, one moment it all made sense. Patches, the dog's name, patches like castor oil. He just hated it being, being pinned down and having it poured down his throat. Welcome to the world of evangelism. <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, it's pearls before a swine because of the way we're laying it on. Other times it's because people are not receptive at all. And Jesus says we need to judge carefully so that we're not wasting time and energy and the preciousness of, uh, of God's word. Not everybody is open to the gospel. Oh well, my goodness, how, what am I supposed to do then? Well, verses 7 to 12. We're to seek God's wisdom when it comes to judging. There Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Again, how am I to know who to share with, how to share with, you know, how do I make that kind of a judgment? Well, the first thing, we're to be persistent in asking for this kind of wisdom. The word ask means to beg, to implore, to beseech. By the way, it's never used that way when Jesus is asking anything of the Father in heaven. When he's praying, he's just asking. When we pray, Jesus uses a different term and says that we should be begging, imploring, beseeching God that he would give us discernment, that we could distinguish, especially when it comes to spiritual things, sharing the gospel, ministering to others. And of course, as many of you know, uh, it's in the present tense. So the asking, the seeking, the knocking are to be continual. So we're to be persistent, but not just persistent. Secondly, we're to be confident when asking for wisdom. Our asking God for wisdom is illustrated uh, as a, a, you know, again, a father giving a, a gift. If the son is asking him for a bread, would a father give him stone? If he asked for a fish, would he give him a snake? Uh, if though you being evil know how to give good gifts, that, and if you're persistent in asking, uh, you should be confident as well because God will give that which you're uh, asking for. Uh, another book, a book by Seymour Hersh uh, on uh, the late John Kennedy called uh, The Dark Side of Camelot, he tells, uh, which is not a flattering book uh, of Kennedy, by the way, but he tells one story that is uh, very interesting. Uh, early on, Kennedy's son Patrick was uh, born prematurely uh, and, uh, and eventually died of, a, of a, a complications, a, a lung ailment. Uh, he, was on the, he was in the hospital, eyes. Kennedy was coming to visit him one afternoon. And uh, uh, he was on the fifth floor, and that whole floor had been uh, cleared out and uh, only had Secret Service agents and so forth. One of them uh, observed uh, uh, President Kenny coming down the hall. And there was a door open and two little girls uh, playing in the room that were like four and five years old, uh, severely bandaged because of burns uh, that they had. Uh, and he happened to catch their eye and, and see them. And he, uh, again, this is not prompted by any kind of publicity because nobody's there. He just... He just turned and he went into the room and sat there and talked with the girls for a little bit and wrote them each a little note and signed it and uh, gave it to them and wished them well and then went on down the, the hallway to be with his, uh, his own suffering son who, who died the very next day. And this is what um, uh, Mr. Hirsch writes. He says, if a mere man, even a president, can show love and concern to two unknown children, 
while his own son is suffering and dying, how much more will our infinite Father in heaven take concern in us? You know, if we really need to distinguish, you know, what's the best way to share with this person? Spiritual things, sacred things. How do I best minister to somebody else in the, in the body of Christ that might be hurting if I've removed the plank out of my own eye and the Lord is now going to allow me the, uh, the privilege of, of ministering to somebody else who maybe is, is, is struggling. Uh, but I'm not exactly sure how, how to do that. I can gain discernment through the, the training of God's word. But also, I, I need the Lord. I need the Holy Spirit. Uh, and again, in Luke's gospel, when this illustration, this teaching is given, the good gift is, and will he not give you the Holy Spirit, Luke says. So we need the Lord. We need the Holy Spirit in this area. If we are persistent in asking, we also can be confident asking, and God will give it so that, uh, so that we can minister. He cares about the person that we care about as well. And, uh, and sometimes uh, we lack discernment. We lack the how-to because we're not, we're not asking. And then also we're to ask for wisdom so that we may treat others in the same way we would want to be treated, the so-called golden rule. And uh, a lot of folks, again, love to quote this. Again, this is a favorite verse of (laughs) non-Christians. I don't know why. Do unto others as you would have them do unto unto you. Don't judge me, man. They know portions of the Sermon on the Mount, but uh, uh, not the whole thing. Uh, And they say it as though this is the sum total of of Christian faith or whatever, which it's not. It doesn't complain uh, all of God's truth nor of God's plan of redemption and so forth. But it's a great principle for believers that can be applied in every, every avenue of our lives. The person that practices the golden rule refuses to do or say anything to someone else that he would not want done or said about himself. That kind of clarifies a lot of this issue of, uh, uh, of judgment and when I'm crossing this, this line. That kind of, that kind of helps, I, I think, if we'll, we'll keep the golden rule in mind. We need to judge uh, very carefully uh, uh, and not judge when, we, when it's an issue of the motive uh, of a person's heart. We need to judge ourselves first. Or we'll be blind to our own problems, unable to help others. We need to pray for wisdom so we can make right judgments. And we need to apply the golden rule uh, because sometimes we're the one being judged. And I, and I kind of want to turn this thing on its head for a minute because uh, that's another issue related. Sometimes we're on the other end. We're the one getting judged by somebody else. And uh, how do we deal with it then? Do we go back to that person and instead of saying, don't judge me, man, we say, get some discernment, man. <laughs> how, how do we... How do we deal with it when we're, we feel like we're being uh, judged un- unfairly? Um, well, again, let me le- read a little quote from a book called Confessions of a Pastor by Craig Gro- Groeschel. Uh, he says, uh, in terms of handling situations like this, unjust criticism, he says, it's a fact that hurt people hurt people. Right? You've been, you're being hurt by somebody? It's probably because they're hurt. He says that they usually dislike themselves, criticize others in a misguided effort to validate themselves. If one of these injured souls lobs a criticism grenade in your direction, diffuse it with understanding. Part of the considering uh, the source is seeking awareness of what that person may be going through. One time I was praying during worship a few moments before I was preaching, eyes closed, focusing on God. I felt someone slip a note in my hand and I never saw who it was, but the note was marked personal. I thought to myself, someone probably wrote a nice note to encourage me before I preach. A a warm, loving feeling settled over me as I unfolded the paper. A moment later, I lost the loving feeling. (laughs) (laughs) Evidently, the note was from a woman who had tried to see me on Friday, my day off. She took offense at my absence and blasted me with hateful accusations. This happened literally seconds before I was to stand up and preach. In that moment, I had a choice. I could internalize the offense and become demoralized and discouraged. Or I could ask myself, I could wonder what she's experiencing that caused her to lash out. I chose compassion over depression. 
my heart hurt for her. I knew that such a disproportionate reaction must indicate deep pain. So I didn't take her note personally. Consider the source. Consider the possibility that the jab may have come from an injured heart. Dismiss it and move on. If you don't, you may become the very thing you despise. Let's pray. Father, we uh, realize that when uh, Jesus tells us to stop doing something, it's because we need to stop doing it. And, uh, and, and nobody's uh, immune uh, to the, uh, the correction of, uh, of Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount on these uh, variety of subjects. And, uh, and certainly, Lord, we're not as well. So, Lord, I pray that by your grace we would, we would stop it. We would stop our tendency uh, to judge others, in this case, uh, in the body of Christ, in a condemning critical way, when there's no way that we have all the facts, when there's no way that uh, we can come to some kind of final decision because we don't know the internal workings of the other person's life or their motives or, or, or again, or all the facts or, or circumstances. Lord, so we pray that by your spirit, you would help us do that. Uh, bring that correcting still small voice to our heart and mind when we find ourselves in that situation and I pray that we would then repent from it. And Lord, I pray that we would continue to study to show ourselves approved workmen who do not need to be ashamed, who can correctly handle the word of truth, who've trained themselves in godliness through your word so that we can have discernment, so that we can distinguish truth from error. Lord, and, uh, and God, when we do need to make a judgment, may we judge ourselves first. Help us remove the plank out of our own eye that we then might be able to minister to someone else. If we've had a, a, a huge issue and you deliver us uh, from it, Lord, then certainly we can minister to someone else who is struggling with that same issue, but to a far lesser degree. God, so we pray that uh, as you work in our lives, then we'd be able to help and minister and just share uh, with others what you've done and, and how you've brought us freedom in, in different areas, Lord. Lord, and may we do unto others as you would have them do unto us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Oh, baby. 